David, were you able to hear all of that? I was, I, I was indeed. And uh, hi, Doug. Hi, David. Uh, we're old pals, and we've both been in the SETI community for a very long time. And this uh, recent fight, uh, <laughs> tussle over it, uh, you should know that uh, a large fraction of the um, senior scientists like John Billingham, uh, diplomat who helped to organize the what's called the two SETI protocols, um, Michael Michaud and I and a large number have resigned from all of the SETI committees um, because um, it's been a little bit more acerbic than Doug would lead you to believe because um, we have felt as if this is not being done properly. And um, let me just dive into this because what's happening is that several of our dear colleagues want to poke at the experiment. And if you've ever really taken any uh, apprenticeship in science, you know that that's really, there's a burden of proof uh, on those who want to poke at the experiment when listening is uh, giving us data and it's terribly important. Uh, we are like four-year-olds who have found ourselves suddenly in a um, dark, very strange forest that's quiet, unexpectedly quiet, maybe too quiet to use a cliche, and uh, to suddenly run around the forest screaming, you who, um, I would say that there's a certain burden of proof to that. Look, um, the Fermi paradox, you should look it up, is the question of why, if there's been 14 billion years, uh, our Earth is only four and a half billion years old, why we don't see any of the great works that our descendants may start building in just a couple of centuries, why we don't see signs of past colonization of our Earth or our solar system. Uh, if we head out there, we'll probably herd around the asteroids and mine them in other solar systems. Uh, there would have been archaeological or geological evidence of past colonizations on Earth. So it's not just the lack of sign of uh, radio signals out there. The Fermi paradox is very perplexing, and I've been writing about it for 30 years, and there are about 100 potential explanations. And one thing I've noticed is people tend to leave at one and declare that's the answer. And that's a sure sign that a scientific field is very immature and has very little data. So I'm all in favor of continuing to collect data. As Moses points out, uh, 20 years ago, we knew of no planets outside of our solar system. Now we know of thousands. When you are learning that rapidly, why do you have to poke at the experiment? 10 years from now, we will know a lot more about the galactic situation. And perhaps people like Doug will be able to refute some of the fears of the more paranoid people. Well, you know what? The, if you look at human history and first contact between civilizations, if you look at what happened to all the marsupials of South America when the Panama land bridge raised up and the, and the placental mammals from North America swept in, contact situations in nature and in history have been fraught with dangers and difficulties. Now, I want to talk about a few of the assertions that are made by the METI guys. One is the Lucy uh, notion and or the barn door. The, it, it's useless to close the barn door because the, the horses have already gone out. And they point to the noisy 1980s. The Earth is much quieter now from, viewed from space than the 1980s. But in fact, almost none of our leakage, if you actually calculate it out, Hollywood has taught you that I Love Lucy is seen by everybody. But even the Medi guys now admit that it would take um, human technology extrapolated two or three or four hundred years into the future to actually pick up I Love Lucy. Imagine you're at the edges of a lake and you're trying to communicate with a Boy Scout camp across the lake. You could slap on the surface of the lake and hope they have super, 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 super instruments and computers. And they might detect your, your Morse code signal. Or you can take out a laser pointer and aim it at them across the lake. That is actually the scale difference between I Love Lucy and what these guys want to do. They want to make us millions and millions of times 
more detectable, changing some of Earth's most absolutely basic observable characteristics without submitting an environmental impact study of any kind. And, they, and, they, and, and Doug claims they're Canadian. <laughs> Look, precautions against potential dangers are actually done a lot these days. NASA has a planetary protection office that scrubs the missions we're going to land on other worlds to make sure we don't pollute them with um, bad life forms or invasive species, and especially any samples that are brought back. There was the argument over the H5N1 flu um, uh, decryption that was going to be published online, and they decided maybe we shouldn't. Uh, CERN studied whether or not they might uh, make black holes. The National Academy of Science in the United States um, did a report on geoengineering and how we should take precautions. And of course, AI. Right now, there are serious people investigating the possibilities of how we can develop AI responsibly so that it doesn't terminator or matrix, you know, destroy all humans. Look, some of the scenarios in science fiction are lurid. I'm a science fiction author as well as an astronomer, and I'll admit some of the stories and tales are lurid. But that doesn't mean that they are perforce automatically unreflective of possibilities. Uh, if, if aliens are descended from gregarious apes like us, they might have an augmenting empathy that leads to altruism. What if they're descended from pack carnivores or from stalking carnivores or paranoid omnivores like bears? I don't know. And I don't want to impose upon my children, who will know a lot more and be a lot smarter than Doug and me, a fait accompli prematurely. Um, and, and the problem is that some of Doug's associates um, now poo-poo, they use the word sci-fi in a dismissive term, which is so weird for SETI guys to do. <laughs> I mean, you're looking for aliens. So why are you using sci-fi as a disparagement? Our earlier oceanographer spoke of citizen science, and here's the key. Here's what we want to do. We don't want to impose an Orwellian uh, moratorium forever on beaming into space. As a matter of fact, I participated in Alan Tufts, um, uh, the late Toronto professor's uh, website that made a greeting to potential aliens who might be self-replicating probes living in our, living in our um, asteroid belt. And I talk about this possibility and some others in my novel existence. Um, so I'm perfectly willing to contemplate METI, but we should do it in a responsible way. And one thing you never hear these guys talk about is due process. Doing this in a scientific way by setting up not just committees, not just conferences to discuss it in which we might invite historians and biologists and all the people who some of the Medi guys have been avoiding because they're sure of their assertions. What could go wrong? But inviting the whole world. Our oceanographer just before me talked about millions of people participating. Can you imagine a television or web show in which uh, we have... Um, Millions of people participating online in these debates over Medi and SETI. It would be fun. It would be interesting. And I think we'd all come out better able to decide what to do next. Thank you.